Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me at the Open Hardware Summit Europe. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I hope to entertain and amaze you all the same remotely. My name is Madeline Gannon. I head madlab.cc. It's a research studio inventing better ways to communicate with machines that make things. A lot of the work that I do looks at CNC machines as the primary machines that we make things. So like 3D printers, CNC routers, laser cutters, and industrial robots. And I'm always striving to make more human-centered interfaces for using these incredible machines. In the past, I've worked a lot with 3D printing and the sort of trials and tribulations of designing things for the body to be 3D printed. So I've looked at how we can make the geometry that we design for 3D printers more context-aware and fabrication-aware um, of what a designer wants to do and how it's going to come back out into the physical world from the computer. So this project, Reverb, lets you 3D model a, a wearable directly around a 3D scan of your body. It solves all of the optimization problems and post-processing problems for 3D printing, and you can just send it to a printer and print it out and wear it, since it's designed around your scan of your body. Uh, it's automatically sized to fit. We sort of collapse a lot of the technical nuances of digital design and digital fabrication into um, a single pipeline. Likewise, I've done a bit of work with interfaces, other interfaces for 3D printing. This project, Tactum, really asked a, a very straightforward question. If we're 3D modeling wearables that we're eventually going to put back on our body, why 3D model them in the computer? If we're designing things for the body, why not design them on the body? So Tactum senses your skin's based interactions, sends that to a 3D modeling back end um, that transforms a digital design that gets projected onto your body and then you can export that for 3D printing. The other area that I'm exploring, this is more recent work, is the machines themselves. So how we can engage the um, hardware itself to be more understanding of us as we share the same space. About inventing, inventing better ways, better ways to, communicate to communicate with machines, with machines that can make things. things. For a long, For a long time, time, industrial robots, robots have been, been the culprit, culprit of automation, automation and replacing human, human labor. Basically, Basically all the all easy tasks, tasks to automate, to automate have, been have been automated. Been automated. Now, now what we're working on is um, using these tools to, to enhance, enhance or augment, or augment human, human labor. labor. That's not very exciting. exciting. Industrial, Industrial robots, robots are really, really fantastic, fantastic CNC machines. CNC machines. We put, put a different tool at the end of the, the arm, arm, and all of a sudden they can do a whole different thing. thing. So, so in the morning, you can be doing spot welding, you can even doing painting. It's just highly adaptable. Another thing Another that, thing I'm, that I'm, really I'm really working, working towards, towards is finding ways, ways to bring these machines, machines out of factories, factories and into and live environments. environments. So, onto so onto construction, construction sites, or onto, onto film sets, sites. There's, there's chance, chance for, for unpredictable, unpredictable objects, objects like, like people, people to, to be moving into, into the environment. environment. That's one of the That's reasons, reasons why I wanted to build the system to, to give this robot, robot eyes, eyes so that it could that actually see and, and safely collaborate and share its space. If, if I'm wearing or if I'm holding these, these motion, motion capture, capture markers, markers, it knows, it knows where, where I am where in, space, in space, it knows how I'm moving in space. Now all of a sudden we can give the machine a nuanced understanding of our intention in that space. You can get you someone who's never seen a robot before and have and them have begin to do to do with things with just a couple minutes of interaction with the machine. Finding, Finding ways, ways to bring, bring in digital, in digital design and fabrication technologies to that could be monumental if we can figure out how to do that safely. 
it's really an amazing benefit of being here in Pier 9. It is physical space and the mental space to just experience. And it's been really fantastic to have the freedom to question how we do systems now and push the boundaries of what's possible with robotics. So if we look at the current state of industrial robotics, um, this, is, this is how robots tend to be used. They're on factory lines, they're working, doing a very similar task 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what you'll notice here is that there's strict separation between where people are and where the robots are. And sort of cutting edge human robot interaction for industrial settings is these gates that sort of lift, let you place something, and then to go away. And there's really good reason for this. Industrial robots are they're dangerous machines, especially when moving at high speeds. And you, the sort of owner's manual for them are just riddled with uh, visions of your demise and death. Um, so there's a lot of barriers for pulling these things out of factories and putting them into live settings or creative settings. Um, for the most part, the difficulties come with how you have to acquire knowledge to do non-normative things with these machines. So for ABB robots like this orange one I just showed, you really have no choice but to sift through a bunch of PDFs and stitch together information um, for, for doing these oddball things that these robots were never intended to do. And then, when you eventually get stuck and you don't know what to do, you can call support and they're so helpful, they just send you another PDF. So a lot of the work that I did at Pier 9 was just finding ways to have intuitive interaction with these incredible machines and eliminate a lot of the really needless technical barriers to um, experimenting and exploring with these things. So I was fortunate enough as a part of this artist residency to have access to a big, giant, scary robot and a, a really nice motion capture system. And what I did uh, with the software I developed was just build a bridge between the two. So the motion capture system is really fantastic at locating um, sensors, markers, in three-dimensional space. The robot is really fantastic of moving to three-dimensional points in space. By linking these two together, I was able to um, transfer the sight from the motion capture system um, to the actuation of the robot. So just really briefly, this is sort of, if you're not familiar with it, this is how motion capture works. You have a set of cameras. Um, I'm only showing two here, but usually they have around between six to 12. It is looking for these retroreflective um, dots that are um, reflecting light back to it to create a plane. So this is called a rigid body. That rigid body has a center point and it has an orientation. And it just so happens that industrial robots like poses that are formatted as a center point and an orientation. So by building this bridge, uh, I was able to let the robot know where I was in space. It could read my body posture and it can understand where I was going, what I was doing. Um, and just a very, very intuitive control software that requires no programming whatsoever. Um, and you get this sort of instant feedback and there's a bit of d discoverability for how to uh, work with this machine. So admittedly, industrial robots are almost by definition closed pieces of hardware. Um, and although there are initiatives to develop open hardware versions for robot arms, still one of the biggest challenges is what do we actually do with this incredible machine now that we have access to it? So for the past three months, I've been collaborating with media artist Dan Moore at the Studio for Creative Inquiry to create an open frameworks add-on 
that um, gives a bunch of tools right out of the bag for using six-axis robot arms. We've been working with a universal robot, which is a collaborative robot on this, not an industrial robot. Um, and we give you a lot of examples for the most basic ways that people use robotic arms, whether it's um, direct manipulation, geometry-based manipulation, keyframe animation, or even motion capture-based um, motion. Here's a, a short film that Dan put together um, in actually a couple hours between creating, editing, and, and sh creating, shooting, and editing um, just by using keyframe animation. And you can see how we can imbue sort of personality and curiosity into the posturing of this little machine. I've been working with motion capture primarily to again be able to translate my gestures and my attention to begin to animate a character. So here we're recording and we can play back the character animation. And we can also tie geometry to motion capture to do more complex stuff. So on the left, for example, we see the robot keeping up with me as I'm moving a surface around it. It's drawing with me. Um, and so again, this project is now live today. Um, you see the, the GitHub repo link below. And I just want to say a special thank you to Dan Moore and the Frank Gracchi Studio for Creative and Create for collaborating with me on this project. So just to tie everything back together, um, these are incredible machines. These industrial robots or robotic arms in general are incredible machines, but they're also incredibly closed. Um, my ambition in creating open interfaces for these pieces of hardware is that we can, as a community, create um, a lot of experimental uses uh, and case studies for these machines that haven't been thought of inside of industry hopefully in some ways leapfrog over industry. Um, so thank you so much for, for staying and listening to the talk. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the summit and I look forward to your questions. Okay, um, yeah, we realize that this is, of course, not absolutely ideal, but we're also very happy that uh, Madeline has so much to do that she actually, even though she didn't want to, had to cancel so last minute. Um, I am trying to pass by the time until Matthias actually um, happens to get her on Skype, and you can ha um, have her directly, but maybe you could also already think of a question that you want to ask her as soon as she's up. Um, uh, yeah. Also, um, yes, another thing that is just for practical reasons, I wanted to let you know that our next presenter, you probably have already realized we rearranged the problem a little bit because we we're so late, um, is go are, going, are going to be, I have to say in this case, Victor Masson and Pablo Gallo, um, because they have to go sound check later on, so therefore we have to kind of like get them into it earlier. Um, and Andreas Yagian is going to present after those two. Um, so yeah, it's just a rearrangement. Nobody got out of the program or anything. Um, just to let you know about this. Okay, and here we have Madeline. <laughs> I can hear you great. <laughs> okay, great. Well, hi, Madeline. <laughs> nice to see you, even this way. Hello, hello. <laughs> um, are there any questions from the audience to Madeline Gannon? Wonderful. I just need to run through them. <laughs> hello. Thank you, Madeline, for a nice video. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a new way of doing talks, but I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, my question is like, what's what was the response? I don't know from like ABB or like these companies that do like these uh, industrial robots, and like where do you see like a timeline in the future where like 
as far as I understand it, like the servos and like the sensor equipment, like the cameras and the library for the cameras are like the most expensive things. Like in itself, like they're not really, like it's just steel welded together like you well said. Um, so like question number one is how did these vendors like, you know, how are they seeing like the open source and your documentation project and if they're helping or not? And the second question is of course like, um, are, are there any efforts like to um, make it make it cheaper? What's the timeline in which it could be adoptable to more people? Thank you. So just to be quick, I have a little bit of feedback. So was how do we make this here as open as quick as possible? Um, I'm just going to go for it. Uh, I'm having a little bit of tech issues, but um, I'm not directly involved in any hardware initiatives. I've worked in the past, uh, actually at the Open Hardware Summit um, in Rome, I presented some projects with, a, with another collaborator where we were just focusing on the hardware that goes on the end of a robot, because that's another really expensive and really uh, closed system itself for non-normative stuff, it's a normative. Um, there's a lot of really interesting $10,000 uh, collaborative, smaller robots that are starting to pop up on the scene. It's very exciting. Uh, they're, they're also not open art projects, but there's a competition that's moving in. And I think that people are realizing that as these machines get more um, more people are interested and, and working harder to, to make the industry more competitive. Currently, you're, if you're a large company like ABB, you're mainly selling robots to GE or Ford or BMW um, and sort of write the rules of that relationship. Uh, when you have lots of consumers to go after, it's more competitive and you have to offer other products that's easier to read. So, like, if I understand correctly, like, one of the, like, like you also, one of the big issues is I also, like, had the opportunity to test, like, the collaborative robots that you used, like, in your video, like, also Yumi and also, like, the other one, I think some Danish company makes it, and I was really, like, impressed, like, I programmed one to give me a massage, <laughs> and uh, it was, it was awesome, like, I 3D printed, like, the, the part for massaging, and I just, like, you know, attached a heater on it. It was just like my girlfriend, but, you know, 24-7. Um, it was awesome. Like, I, I, if it would be cheaper, you know, <laughs> it, I think my girlfriend would buy me one. Um, but, yeah, I think that, that also, like, like you said, the, the big thing is, like, to make them safer to be around human. And there's also, like, a company here in Vienna. It's called Blue, the new robotics. And basically, they're making, like, a haptic skin feedback like for robotic arms so even like if the robotic arms were not were not designed like to to feel something like with with the impl implementation of these models they can be made to feel something you know so it's i think it's a like a nice um, add on so thanks again <laughs> so a lot of the work that i do is just sort of anticipating when we're going to have this incredible hardware and ready access and cheap prices and trying to get what we do with them, sort of um, getting its own momentum. All right, thank you very much. Are there any further questions for now? Yeah. Mm. How do I get there? <laughs> so sorry, I was pulled up from running all you wonderful people in Vienna, um, but I think it's okay to hear from you. Hi, uh, very nice uh, stuff you're doing. One question, did you ever think of or did you already experiment potentially with VR um, gear to interact with robots? I couldn't quite hear the question. Are you asking if I've experimented with VR yeah. to... Uh, did you ever think of or did you experiment already with, with virtual reality, augmented reality gear to interact with robots? Um, that is something that is in the pipeline. We have a couple HoloLenses now in the lab that I'm developing the Open Frameworks add-on 
uh, out of. And so, but really, I think it's it's a quite amazing use case that we have a way of having an actor in a space that can be directly linked to a virtual reality or an augmented reality space um, that someone who's immersed in the headset can actually engage um, someone in physical space. I think that's a really, really interesting space and there's going to be a lot of cool stuff in the coming months in that area. <laughs>